I'm pleased to welcome today Dr. Richard Fox from Butterfly Conservation, who is the Head of Science uh, at Butterfly Conservation, and he's going to be talking to us today about the state of the UK's butterflies 2022 and delving into that report and, and what went behind it. So over to you, Richard. Looking forward to this. Thanks very much, Kieran. Uh, it's great to be here. Lovely to see so many uh, people, or not to you, because you've all kindly turned your uh, cameras off in uh, in response to Kieran's pleas. Uh, but great to uh, great to have you along. So yeah, I'm going to be talking about the uh, a report that we published earlier this year called "The State of the UK's Butterflies 2022." It is the uh, get my slides moving. Why are they not moving? interesting okay we will cope um so this is the fifth such report that we've published since the first one back in 2001 and the idea of these state of reports is to present the most recent assessment of how our butterflies are faring the other buttons aren't working that's weird okay um uk butterflies are one of the best monitored well, they're certainly the best monitored insect taxon anywhere in the world. We have long term nationwide information on both the distributions, the ranges of species and their populations, their abundance, uh, dating back to the 1970s and indeed beyond. And all of that information comes from citizen scientists, amateur entomologists, whatever, whatever you want to call yourselves. Hopefully many of you uh, watching this uh, this um, uh, presentation uh, have contributed to these schemes yourselves. Um, all of this comes thanks to a long tradition of natural history study and recording we have in the UK. We're very fortunate to have that tradition. We're all part of it. And it's fantastic that that tradition is as popular today as it's ever been before. So there are more people recording butterflies across the UK today than at any point in the past, which is obviously a really fantastic and healthy position to be in. All of this amazing volunteer effort is channeled through two main recording schemes. The standardized monitoring of butterfly populations is carried out by volunteers uh, through the UK butterfly monitoring scheme. And the main method used is the butterfly transect that was developed by Ernie Pollard, who's in the photo there, and his colleagues back in the 1970s. And the transect involves walking a fixed route in good weather and recording every single, counting every single butterfly uh, that comes within an imaginary five meter box. And we have long-term recording long-term monitoring of butterfly populations at a very large number of sites in the UK. And thanks to that, we can produce long-term robust population trends for almost all the UK's butterfly species. So the map, map there shows the all of the sites where UK butterfly monitoring scheme uh, counts were taking place in the year 2019, with the different colours representing the different methods that all go into that scheme. The other main uh, scheme, sorry, I'm just having a little bit of trouble getting the slides to move on, hence my hesitancy, uh, but the other main scheme is Butterflies for the New Millennium, and that's the distribution recording scheme for butterflies in the UK. So this is a very different kind of recording. Uh, to take part in this, people simply note down any life cycle stage of any butterfly species uh, anywhere in the UK on any day of the year. And because of that huge flexibility, that ability to, you know, could be just out in your garden or you could be spending all your free time roaming the countryside recording butterflies, uh, we get a huge number of, uh, of records in each year, very widespread coverage. So you can see from the map there, uh, which shows five years of recording. Uh, for the Butterflies for the New Millennium project. And you can see that 
almost everywhere in the UK had some butterfly records in that time. And for the places that are shown, or the each dot there represents a 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer grid square on the, uh, the national grid. And uh, you can see for all of the red and dark red ones, that there's an enormous number of records, over a thousand records per square, uh, and some of them many, many more. So there's a lot of recording effort going in. We know a lot about uh, where our butterflies are as a result of all that effort. Now, those two schemes, uh, well, for the report, for the State of UK's Butterflies Report, we've used about 23 million records from those two schemes. And we, uh, we're basically looking at long-term analyses from the 1970s up until the end of 2019. That's the most recent time period in the, uh, in the report, in the various trends that I'm going to be presenting. Now, the two sources of data uh, from those two main schemes, as I've already uh, suggested, are very different. They have to be analysed in very different ways, which I'm not going to say anything about. Um, but uh, they provide uh, equally useful, important and indeed complementary information about how our butterflies are faring. So just to give you an example then uh, of the kind of information that we can get from all of this fantastic uh, data, this, these fantastic records that are sent in by thousands upon thousands of, uh, of volunteers each year. So here's a butterfly that's fared really badly uh, in the UK over the last sort of 40, 50 years, the small pearl border fritillary. Uh, I've only, I'm only using English vernacular names for the butterflies. I'm not sure if, there, if we've got many people watching from overseas uh, so apologies, I'm not, I'm not going to use the scientific names for them. This is Valoria Cellini, um, but I'm not going to do that all the way through. Um, so if you look at the map first, this is the map is generated from the Butterflies of the New Millennium data. Uh, the coloured dots represent places where small pearl border fritillary was seen in the most recent five years, 2015 to 2019. And hopefully you might be able to see that there are some other symbols some little crosses and some little open blue circles, which show where the butterfly has been recorded in the past, but no longer occurs. It's become extinct in those places. And then on this side of the, of the slide, uh, we've got these two graphs and the trends that are calculated from them. So the lower graph here is generated from the records that sit behind the map. So it's not a direct analysis of what's shown on the map, but it takes all of those records, it puts them through a complex uh, statistical process called occupancy modeling uh, that enables us not only to look at how uh, the distribution of the species has changed over time, but also to take into account the fact that people record in different places over time as well. The recording effort changes and we need to be able to account for that. Essentially, what you can see is that, uh, that the trend for small pearl border fertility distribution, how widespread it is in Britain, shows a big decline since the 1970s. And then the upper plot here, this is a, this is a, a graph of the abundance of small pearl border fertilities counted on transects as part of the UK butterfly monitoring scheme. So you can see there are good years, there are high peaks, there are years when pearl border fritillary does well, and then there are very poor years like this one down here. And it's, it's really important that we have that monitoring year after year over a long time period. Uh, because if you just take two snapshots in one, you know, some point in the past and then a recent year, uh, that can give you a really misleading uh, idea of how a species is doing. But by having year on year on year, monitoring at these sites, we can we can see through all that noise and get a really clear picture of how the species has changed in reality. So that's a species that's done really badly, but before you all get too uh, concerned and worried and, and uh, uh, sad about our butterflies, I'll give you another quick example of a species that's done well over the last uh, 40, 50 years, and that's the comma. So again, draw your attention to the map on this side, first of all, from the butterflies to the new millennium data. 
So the purple dots there show the entire distribution of the comma in the UK back in the 1970s. And since then, the species has spread a lot, spread rapidly northwards, such that by the end of last century, it had colonized all of uh, all of these new areas shown in this sort of yellowy orange color, gold sort of color. Um, so by the end of the 20, uh, yeah, the end of the 20th century, uh, the comma colonized most of northern England, and that range expansion has continued uh, up until the end of the period that we're talking about at the moment. So, so the comma has now recolonized Scotland and uh, in, is found widely across lowland parts of, uh, of Scotland. And again, the two graphs on, over here on this side of the slide, uh, the bottom one uh, is, is derived from the, the data behind that map. So that shows a big increase in the commas distribution. And the top one is our uh, counts of the comma at sites from the UK butterfly monitoring scheme. So the number of commas counted at transect sites and other, other parts of the UK butterfly monitoring scheme has increased uh, as well as the comma becoming more widespread across the landscape. Okay, so let's get on to some results. What, uh, what are the actual results from this uh, report? And I don't expect you to be able to read all of this on the, uh, on the slide here, so don't worry too much about the detail. But these are the species level results with abundance over here on the left and distribution trends here on the right. And they're ranked. So the species that have done best, that have the most positive trends in either abundance or distribution are at the top of the, of the slide in blue. And the ones that have done worse, that have the most negative trends are at the bottom of the slide shown in red. And the color of each bar, uh, or rather the bold colors show the trends that are statistically significant. All that means really is that those are the ones that we have a high level of confidence are an accurate reflection of what's happened to that species uh, in the UK over uh, the past 40, 50 years. So at the top of the chart, to save you straining your eyes and trying to read the tiny little font on there, uh, at the top of the charts, we have species like large blue, checkered skipper, purple emperor, which have all done really well uh, over this time period. I'm gonna come back to some of these later on with a bit more detail of what's been happening with them. Uh, and down at the bottom of these charts, down at the, the bottom of the results, if you like, the species that have fared really poorly, uh, species like the wall, northern brown argus and grayling, which have all declined significantly, both in their abundance at regularly monitored sites and also in their distribution, how widespread they are across the UK. And again, I'll come back to some more detail about some of those uh, in a minute. Now, it's really important that we know how each species has done. Uh, that's part of the reason for showing you uh, this, this uh, view. Um, it's really important, not least because we, you know, we can't, we can't, we don't have the resources to conserve absolutely everything, to put a huge amount of effort into the conservation of everything all the time. We need to be able to prioritize the species that are most in need of conservation effort, those that are declining most rapidly, that are most at risk. So for, for reasons like that, it's really important that we know how each individual butterfly species is doing across the UK. But it's also important, I think, that we have a general sense of how our butterflies are faring. And that's the kind of thing that politicians might be interested in. Their, you know, their eyes are going to glaze over, sadly, if we start talking about you know, how Northern Brown Argus or Silver Wash Cotillery has done. Uh, we need to be able to talk about how butterflies are faring as a whole. And there are a number of different ways we can do that. Um, uh, a fairly simple way is just to look at the, uh, the trends, the positive and negative trends. So looking at abundance trends first from the UK Butterfly Monitoring Scheme, and there are some examples there across the bottom with their trend values. Um, we find that 
slightly more species have declined significantly in their abundance as have increased. So there are butterflies that are doing well, as a comma example I showed, but there are more species that are decreasing in their abundance at these really intensively monitored sites. The distribution trends show a much more clear cut picture. And again, there are some examples for you across the bottom of the screen there. But in terms of distribution change, we find that almost four times as many butterfly species have declined significantly in the UK since the 1970s as have increased. And then if we roll those two things together, uh, we can see that overall, almost twice as many species have decreased significantly in at least one of the measures. So in either abundance or distribution or both uh, than have increased. So although there are some butterfly species that are doing well, by and large, most butterfly species are not. Now, another way we can represent the overall sort of pattern of change uh, is using these multi-species indicators. So it looks quite horrifyingly complicated at first glance, this, uh, this chart. But what we've done here is we've taken the trends for each individual species and we've smushed them all together. Um, it's slightly more uh, mathematically complicated than smushing, but that's the general sort of idea of what we've done. We've smushed them all together to give this overall picture. But if I draw your attention to the black lines in the middle first, so this black jagged line shows the year to year change in how the average butterfly has done. So the black line represents all of the butterfly species in the UK, all of their abundance. So again, this is abundance information from the UK Butterfly Monitoring, Monitoring Scheme sites is counts of butterflies, the number of butterflies in each population. Um, and so, yeah, the, the, uh, the zigzag black line shows how uh, all species have done uh, on average from year to year. And then this thicker black line that runs through the middle of it is just a smooth version of that. That's just smoothing out all those peaks and troughs. And over here is the trend over that period back to 1976. So it's hardly changed. And so that is not, that doesn't mean that the total abundance of butterflies that are out there in the country hasn't changed. What it means is that for the average butterfly species, it shows no, very little change in its abundance since the 1970s. So some have gone up, some have gone down, but the average change for the average species is, uh, is very little. But when we start to split the species out, uh, we see some interesting things going on. So the blue lines down here are the habitat specialist butterflies. So it's these are the species that need special places to live. So the butterflies that live on chalk downlands, the butterflies that live on lowland heathland, the butterflies that live on bogs up in uh, in upland Britain uh, and Ireland and Northern Ireland. Um, and so um, those habitat specialist butterflies, when we group those together and we we look at their change over time and this smooth version of it that runs through the middle, uh, we see that they've declined significantly in abundance at these monitored sites. They've lost more than a quarter of their numbers on average. So the average habitat specialist butterfly has lost more than a quarter of its population since the 1970s. And the red line at the top are the wider countryside species. So these are the species that can also live in the normal sort of farmed landscape, um, so perhaps in our urban areas, in parks and cemeteries in urban areas, and, and some of them even in our gardens. And you can see that they've also declined, but not, not by such a great extent. We can do the same thing for the distribution trends. So taking all species and smushing them together to give that black line in the center. And that shows that the, on average, Butterfly, a butterfly has lost 42% of its distribution since the mid 1970s. So the average butterfly has lost almost half of its distribution in the UK since the 1970s. And again, the habitat specialist butterflies in blue faring much, much worse. This horrendous decline. So 
that on average, our habitat specialist butterflies have got much, much rarer since the 1970s. But actually the wider countryside species up here have changed very little in terms of their distribution on average. And then the third and final way that we can try and consider the overall pattern of change uh, is using these butterfly stripes. So these are uh, based on the same idea as the famous climate stripes that you, you may well have seen, the sort of red and blue stripes that illustrate how the, uh, the world or the country or whatever uh, region it's based on uh, is changing with climate change. And the butterfly stripes work in a similar sort of way. So this is using the uh, all species distribution information and the color of each bar, each vertical bar, uh, shows the value of that indicator, that all species indicator uh, for that year. And so as the bars change from sort of greens through yellows to greys, that represents the decline in the distribution of our butterfly species in the UK since the mid 1970s. Okay, so just before I move on to that then, um, I mentioned earlier that the, um, the report, the State of Butterflies report, is focused entirely on long-term trends. So uh, for many species, those go back to the mid-1970s, uh, but we don't necessarily have good enough data for all species to go back that far. But for all species, we've gone back as far as we were able to, as far as the data would allow us to, uh, to create meaningful, robust trends and, and you know therefore a, a valid picture of what's happened. And so we might be inclined to put our rose tinted spectacles on and say, okay, well these are long-term changes. They show lots of declines. You know, some species are doing okay, but the general pattern is is one of decline. Uh, but maybe that all happened in the past. Maybe that was all back in the 1970s and the 1980s, the bad old days when beautiful chalk downland was still being ploughed up and uh, having lots of chemical fertilizers dumped on it and uh, all the rest of it. And maybe everything's fine now. We don't really need to worry. This is just a historical uh, change that's happened. But um, fortunately, from another piece of work that we did just last year, uh, we have uh, some much more recent, much more up-to-date uh, data as well. So last year we published a new red list of British butterflies and the red list process is a globally agreed uh, set of, uh, of criteria that you have to apply. And the one of the fundamental principles of the whole red listing process is that it needs to be based on recent information. And for butterflies, that means based on the last 10 years that you have information for. So for the most recent uh, red list of butterflies in Britain, we use the period 2010 to 2019. So it's pretty up to date. Uh, and we looked at how species had fared over that time period. And that's how we classified them onto the, into the various red list categories. And what we found was that 50% of the remaining butterfly species in Britain were classified either as threatened or as near threatened. So threatened includes the categories critically endangered, endangered and vulnerable. And then there's this extra category of near threatened for uh, species that are, that are approaching the thresholds for, uh, for threatened categories. So 50% of the species uh, had done sufficiently badly over that 10 year period to, uh, to make it onto the red list. And when we compare this new red list with the previous one that we published in 2010, we find that things have actually got worse rather than better. So more species have moved into higher risk categories and have moved in the opposite direction. Uh, overall, there was a 26% increase in the number of threatened species, the number of species on the red list since the, uh, the previous red list. So that shows us that, that you know, this, all of this sort of uh, long-term doom and gloom is not just stuff that happened long ago that we don't need to worry about. It's uh, these processes are still taking place and butterflies are still struggling 
many butterflies are still struggling. Okay, now, one of the things um, that uh, uh, Kieran actually alluded to this in his introduction, one of the things that's new about the state of this most recent state of report, we've never done before in any of the previous state of butterflies reports, is that we've carried out separate analyses for each of the UK countries. So we've analyzed for as many species as the data would allow, uh, distribution trends and abundance trends, long-term trends again, separately for England, Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales. And so let's have a little look at what that sort of thing shows. So I've got a few examples now, species that have generally been faring badly, some of these species have been mentioned already earlier on. So here's a grayling. There's the distribution of the grayling from the butterflies from the new millennium data. And when we look at the separate, when we calculate separate trends for each of the four UK countries. Oh, what's happened there? Oh, OK, sorry. Before I move on to that, um, you can see I've just zoomed in on the map there a bit. And you can see that the grayling has been declining. Uh, particularly in southern parts of England. So all of those little crosses and little open blue circles are places where grayling used to be recorded but hasn't been seen, uh, hasn't been recorded in the most recent uh, five-year survey. And because of this decline, grayling was listed as, is currently listed as endangered on the British Red List. And then when we look at the trends, uh, so we have trends for England, Scotland and Wales for grayling, not enough data yet in Northern Ireland to produce a, a, a robust trend. Uh, but we see that both for abundance from the UK butterfly monitoring scheme and for distribution from butterflies from New Millennium, this species is declining in both of those measures in all three of the countries that we were able to produce trends for. So it's a pretty sorry state of affairs for the grayling. Uh, here's another species, the wall. The wall was once, as you can see from the map, it was once, not very long ago, actually, sort of you know, only a few decades ago, it was a widespread and common butterfly across the normal farmed landscape uh, of certainly of England and Wales. And it's undergone this massive decline, which you can see shown by this huge area of sort of blue, this sea of blue, uh, representing places where wall used to be found, and where it's it's so uh, so reduced and so scarce now that it sort of effectively looks to be extinct across this enormous area of uh, of mainly of England. And as a result of that decline, uh, the wall is also listed now as endangered, not because it's rare, but because it's declining rapidly. Um, and when we look at the trends here, uh, we see an interesting difference. So uh, the species is clearly declining severely uh, in both abundance and distribution in England and Wales. Uh, but in Scotland, at the edge, at the northern edge of its range, uh, it's actually doing well and is continuing to expand its range as the climate warms. We weren't, oh, and, that, and that plot just shows the difference in abundance. So uh, the blue line is the abundance of walls counted at uh, UK butterfly monitoring scheme sites in Scotland. And that kind of browny orange color uh, is the equivalent for sites in England. Uh, that's just going back to the late 1990s, but you can see uh, the amazing contrast with how this butterfly is getting on uh, in Southern Scotland uh, compared to uh, the whole of England. Now, again, we didn't have enough data to produce a trend for wall in Northern Ireland, but to be honest, we don't really need one uh, because the wall is in a pretty sorry state in Northern Ireland. It was previously quite widespread. It was recorded in all six counties of Northern Ireland. But as you can see from the map to make it work, uh, it has gradually dwindled away. And in the last five year period of, of recording, there were only three records of wall from the whole of Northern Ireland in that five year period, all of them from the coastline of County Down. So uh, despite the fact that there isn't sufficient data to, to calculate a, a statistically robust trend, it's very clear that the wall is teetering on the brink of extinction, uh, sadly, in Northern Ireland. 
And here's a, a final example, small heath, and this still is a widespread uh, butterfly in the UK, uh, but it is one that's declining. Um, and you can see there from the distribution trends, uh, where we do have a trend from Northern Ireland, it's declining significantly in all four UK countries, and it was listed as vulnerable in, on the most recent butterfly red list. So just a quick whiz round then. Um, we've also produced those multi-species indicators where we smushed all the uh, trends together for each of the UK countries. So you can see uh, how, how butterflies have sort of done overall in each country. Really bad in England. Butterflies have fared the worst uh, in England compared to the other countries. Uh, but it's not looking great in Northern Ireland either. Um, Scotland is the only country where butterflies have shown a long-term increase uh, in abundance and distribution. Although even there, even in Scotland, um, habitat specialist butterflies are in decline. I'll come back to that point in a, in a few minutes um, and declines again in Wales. So for the remainder of the talk, I'm going to go around the countries with a few little slightly more in-depth uh, examples of how particular species have been doing and particularly trying to focus on some successes, some uh, species that have done well and particularly species that have done well as a result of conservation effort and action. So we'll start, we go around alphabetically, so we'll start in England and with the purple emperor and I mentioned this species earlier on and quite amazingly given you know how Purple Emperor has for, for forever really been considered a, a rare butterfly and a real special thing to go and see as a butterfly enthusiast. Uh, obviously, partly that's because it's big and, and so beautifully coloured, uh, but also because it was quite scarce. And uh, Purple Emperor has shown that proportionally the largest range expansion of any butterfly species uh, in the UK. So there's its distribution back in the 1970s and uh, it, had, it, it hadn't changed a lot by the end of last century. There was a sign that perhaps something was happening here sort of south of London and also sort of uh, to the north of London as well but there wasn't a huge amount of change. Starting to see a bit more momentum gathering by 2009 so remember these orangey gold spots are on in the new places that have been colonized and butterflies turned up for the first time or been recorded for the first time and then in the most in the last decade the most recent decade uh, it's really taken off and uh, and um, is doing fantastically well If we turn to uh, a, a rarer species, a threatened species, the wood white, it's listed as endangered on the current uh, British red list. Uh, the map there shows that uh, you know there aren't there aren't that many landscapes left in Britain where you can see a wood white. Uh, you can see lots of places where it used to occur, where it's gone extinct since the 1970s, uh, and because it's had this um, this long term decline. Uh, but we've been aware of it for a long time. There's been a huge amount of conservation effort, a lot of long-term conservation work in the landscapes where this species still occurs. So woodwhite lives in, uh, in places like this. This is from the West Midlands. Uh, it lives in these nice sunny uh, edges of, of forest tracks. Uh, and there's been this fantastic long-term a succession of conservation projects. Often, often you can only get funding for sort of three years, four years, five years if you're lucky to work on um, species conservation. Uh, but we've managed to, uh, you know, organise back-to-back projects working in the same landscapes to try and look after declining threatened species like the wood white. And it's really paid off. So there was a national census done uh, for wood white uh, between 2005 and 2009, which found that there were only 36 sites uh, in the UK where wood white occurred, and the total amount of habitat that the butterfly occupied was this 216 hectares. And then there's been all this conservation work going on, 
And in the, uh, the last census, 10 years on from the previous one, we see that the Osprey now occupies 610 hectares across 62 sites. So the number of sites has almost doubled and the amount of land that's actually occupied by the, this, uh, this threatened butterfly has almost trebled, all as a result of conservation management, habitat management for this species. And another example then, up at the uh, other end of England, up in Cumbria, uh, this is the marsh fritillary butterfly. And uh, back in 2004, this butterfly was on the, literally on the brink of extinction in Cumbria. Um, its caterpillars live together in family groups. They live, the caterpillars live with their brothers and sisters in a, in a silken web that they spin over their, their food plants. And uh, all of the survey work in Cumbria in that year only revealed one web of caterpillars, obviously at one site in the whole of Cumbria. And that sparked a big conservation project, uh, largely run by volunteers, but also involving a lot of habitat management uh, by the Wildlife Trust and, and other organizations that own the sites where marsh fritillaries used to live in Cumbria, like the one in the uh, in the photo here, these wet grasslands, and it's been phenomenally successful. So that by 2019, there were nearly two and a half thousand of these caterpillar webs recorded at 15 different sites across five separate landscapes within Cumbria. Brilliant example of conservation uh, success for a threatened butterfly. And while I'm on England, I, I must mention the checkered skipper. Again, it got a brief mention earlier on, but um, checkered skipper is a Scottish butterfly, of course. It has this uh, stronghold up here in the, in the west uh, coast of Scotland, um, but it used to occur in England, um, became extinct in 1976. I was gonna say, there should be a little circle there. There it is. Um, and uh, used, yeah, used to occur in the East Midlands of England, went extinct in 1976. And in the last few years, butterfly conservation has led a project to reintroduce the checkered skipper to England. So we brought uh, checkered skippers from Belgium, uh, which were more ecologically and climatically uh, adapted to the kind of conditions that you get in the East Midlands of England compared to the Scottish checkered skippers. Uh, and this reintroduction went went ahead. There was lots of uh, lots of media attention, as you can see, and it's been really successful. So we now have uh, homegrown checkered skippers. There's a checkered skipper caterpillar in the little house that it makes for itself on a grass leaf. Um, homegrown checkered skippers uh, in Northamptonshire, and um, in uh, 2022, last year. There were 150 sightings of checkered skippers along six and up, uh, over six and a half kilometres of woodland rides in this Rockingham Forest landscape in Northamptonshire. So the butterfly is breeding successfully. It's spreading out, which is really good news. You know, it's great to see it colonising different parts of the forest landscape along these woodland rides where it lives. Over to Northern Ireland then. Um, as I've mentioned already, um, Northern Ireland uh, has, so we, we struggle to get trends for a lot of species in Northern Ireland. The data are not quite as strong yet, uh, but they are improving rapidly. Um, the species that we particularly struggle to uh, produce these long-term trends for in Northern Ireland are the scarcer species. Um, and so, our staff and volunteers in Northern Ireland have been working really hard to improve the monitoring, uh, particularly of these scarcer and threatened species uh, in Northern Ireland, so that we will be able to produce robust population and distribution trends for them going forward. And the large heath is a good example. Uh, it's uh, listed as vulnerable on the Irish red list. So there's a separate butterfly red list for the island of Ireland. Um, so large heath is uh, listed as vulnerable, so it's a threatened species in Ireland, and um, there have been a number of monitoring transects set up. It's a bogland species, um, and we're now monitoring its populations on a number of these bogs in Northern Ireland, which is 
fantastic news. Uh, it's a great umbrella species for all the bog uh, conservation and restoration projects that are underway. Uh, and it means that in the future, we'll be able to produce long-term trends for this species in Northern Ireland. Okay, moving up to Scotland. Uh, these are the multi-species indicators for Scotland. I thought it was worth showing these because Scotland is this outlier uh, because species are in general doing uh, better in Scotland than the, in any of the other UK countries. So you can see from the, these multi-species indicators for abundance and for distribution that the, uh, the wider countryside species, these ones shown in red, are the ones that are driving that positive pattern that we see for butterflies. So species like the comma, that's a wider countryside species, which we've already seen its rapid uh, range expansion through Scotland. Uh, there have been other species recolonizing or colonizing Scotland, uh, species like the holly blue, and more recently, the white letter hair streak, which is actually a vulnerable species at a, at a Britain level, but has colonized into the far south of Scotland. Um, are, are doing really well and spreading northwards. But also draw your attention on these multi-species indicators to the blue lines, the habitat specialists. And you can see even in Scotland where things are generally better for butterflies, those species are in decline on average. And here's an example of some great conservation work that's been going on for a, uh, a butterfly called the small blue. Uh, there's its distribution in the UK. And uh, this particular example is from um, uh, up there, a little uh, place called Logie Quarry near Tain in, uh, in Scotland, in Highland Scotland. Um, and it's a disused quarry, uh, scrubbed up, um, and the owners were proposing to uh, develop the quarry into a sort of centre park style um, holiday place um, and butterfly conservation objected uh, uh, because there were small blue and various other important species on the site and thankfully the uh, the development didn't go ahead but in fact the the owners of the quarry have uh, completely embraced the conservation value of the site and have done a huge amount of work clearing back the scrub um, to produce these lovely open flower rich and insect rich habitats, uh, maintaining some trees and scrub as well for the wildlife that's associated with those. And the, uh, and the population of small blues abs absolutely uh, blossoming, blooming at that, uh, at that site. It's a really, really nice example. And then last but by no means least, over into Wales and uh, case study with the high brown fertillary. So high brown fertillary is one of our most endangered species. Um, the map there shows uh, its decline in, uh, in England and Wales since the 1970s. If I put all of the historical, the pre-1970 records of high brown fertillary onto that map, you'd be able to see that this was once a widespread butterfly uh, across most of lowland England and Wales, uh, particularly in woodlands. Um, but it's undergone this massive decline. It's listed as endangered on the red list. And in Wales, it's down to this one remaining site down here in the Allen Valley in Glamorgan. And the, um, the landscape looks like that. That's a view of the Allen Valley. And volunteers, mainly volunteers, have been managing that site for, uh, for decades now trying to maintain it in good condition to try and prevent the loss, the extinction of high brown fertility from the whole of Wales. This is what we want. This is the kind of habitat that those volunteers are working so hard, uh, you know, with hand tools uh, to create. Um, it's violets that you can see there. Hopefully the purpley color is, is flowering violets. Violets are what the uh, high brown fertility caterpillars eat um, and, uh, that's where they want to be. They want to be in amongst this sort of bracken and dead, dead, um, dead bracken litter and uh, dead leaves, which gets lovely and warm in the spring, uh, where the caterpillars are, are out feeding and basking in the sunshine. And as a result, as a result of all that hard work, uh, the 
Butterfly has absolutely thrived in this uh, in this landscape. So back in 1999, the volunteer surveyors were recording only one and a half high ground artillery butterflies for every hour they spent searching, walking along these these paths, looking for trying to count high ground artilleries. And by 2019, 20 years on, that had increased to over 17 adult butterflies per hour. So really, really fantastic response to this conservation work. And there's a new phase of that project starting now uh, as part of this big well, Wales-wide uh, project, species conservation project that involves all sorts of different species from different groups, uh, but also includes uh, high brown artillery. And this is getting uh, livestock back into this site. It's not easy site to graze because it's common land, you can't use fences, uh, but there are some really innovative ways of using uh, free roaming uh, cattle on this site as part of this new project, which will keep the habitat in really good condition. Right, I think we're about there really. So just in summary, um, I think if I, if I had to summarize the whole thing in a sentence and a half, uh, which would have saved you having to watch the last 45 minutes. So sorry, I should have done that at the start, really. You could have gone and had some lunch. Um, but the uh, all of the huge amount of recording and monitoring effort uh, and the conservation work that's been done by thousands and thousands of volunteers and uh, uh, conservation organisations across the UK shows that Butterflies have done badly in Britain. They are doing badly in Britain. More species in the UK, rather. More species are in decline than not. Uh, but we can turn things around. We know what to do for the vast majority of these species, especially the threatened ones. And there are clear signs that conservation, uh, targeted species conservation, uh, can turn around these declines at site level, at landscape level and even at national level so hopefully that's a a a message of, of optimism amongst all the doom and gloom of the stats and trends what can you do you can get involved and help with the uh, the state of our butterflies and the two easiest ways to do that are to take part in recording and hopefully, as I said earlier on, many of you do that already. If you don't and you fancy getting involved in helping the gathering of this, uh, all this amazing data, those 23 million records that were analysed as part of the most recent report, visit the Butterfly Conservation website. We run a range of different recording schemes that you can do in your back garden, you can do out and about. Uh, the information tells you, you know, how much time you might need to, to put into it could be as little as 15 minutes, could be as much time as you want to dedicate to uh, to being out there looking for and counting butterflies. The other really great thing you can do is because, you know, counting butterflies is fantastic. It provides this fantastic data, uh, really strong evidence that we can then take to policymakers, to politicians to try and get positive things done. But at the end of the day, we need to change the countryside. We need to change our landscapes um, in, if we're going to turn things around for butterflies. We can keep counting and counting and counting, but if nothing else changes, then we're just going to be monitoring butterflies to extinction. So the other thing you can do is to create habitat. And Butterfly Conservation has got this new project, this new website it's called Wild Spaces. Uh, it's packed with information about how you can actually help to make a place where butterflies can live. So if you're lucky enough to have a garden, even a patio or a balcony, or if you can exert any influence over a community garden or the local allotments or the local park, uh, there's a huge amount of tailored information on there about what you can do and how it will have a positive impact on, uh, on our butterflies. So finally, just, to, just the thank yous. So thanks to everyone who records butterflies and particularly to those key volunteers, the county recorders, coordinators and champions who process all that information and get it feeding through to the other scientists involved in producing the report and to the wonderful photographers whose uh, images I've used in my talk today.
And that's it from me. So um, happy to take any questions with any time that we have left.